Okay, we will get started. Hello, welcome to today's discussion on the Michigan, Michigan's proposed behavioral health reform. My name is Nikki Gable and I serve as the program manager for MPHI. I oversee the Southeast Michigan Alliance for Addiction Free Communities Coalition, also called CMAC. Today's webinar is part two of two discussions coordinated so that we can learn more about the proposed behavioral health reform legislations allow and allow an opportunity to ask pertinent questions from those directly working in the healthcare industry. Today, we will hear from Senator Mike, Sh Mike Shirky. On September 28th, we had the opportunity to talk with Mary Whiteford. Thank you, Senator, for joining us today. And we are very grateful to have the same opportunity to hear from you. I would also like to welcome Dustin Walsh, our senior healthcare reporter at Cranes, to assist in leading our second conversation on this topic. Dustin, great to see you once again. And I just have a couple of quick housekeeping items before we begin. Um, thank you to all of you who are able to submit questions prior to the event. We appreciate your time and hopefully we'll get to many of those questions today. If you have additional questions as we go along, feel free to add them in the Q&A function at the bottom mm -hmm. of your screen. Um, make sure to please use that as opposed to the chat feature um, and use the chat if you're having any technical assist, um, difficulties. And with that, I will turn this conversation over to Senator Shirky. And once you have concluded your presentation, Dustin, you can take it away with questions. Sure. Okay, course. Nikki, thank you very much sure. for the opportunity to address the organization today. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, everybody should be paying close attention because this these are uh, serious issues that affect lots of people. And it's very, as Dustin and I were talking about before we started, very, very complex. The essence of the proposal that, that uh, the Senate is advancing is the financial, administrative, and clinical integration of behavioral and, and physical health, uh, primarily in the public health sector, Medicaid in specifically. Uh, Michigan has a very mature uh, network of managed care systems throughout our state. Uh, recognized across the nation as being some of the best, if not the best. And we've experienced uh, some terrific uh, returns and performance metrics from that uh, investment that was made you know, almost, almost 35 years ago. Um, we have chosen this time because of the exasper exasperation of, medic of, uh, of, uh, of mental health uh, through what we've experienced over the last 18 months. And it now is time for us to really challenge ourselves. I don't think anybody listening to this, anything participating in this, if asked the question sincerely, would you, if you were to start from scratch, would you design a system that represents what we have today? And I'm pretty sure that the answer would be no, we would not. Of course, it's the difficult, the follow-up question is even more difficult, and that is, well, how do you change it? Well, I know is one thing, um, changing it without doing anything, that won't change a thing. And we've tried a couple of times over the last few years with a pilot pro project called 298 to prove the essence of uh, what we're uh, trying to achieve here, uh, only being met with uh, severe obstruction and uh, resistance and never really get off the ground. And so we just pivoted from and used the little things that we did learn through those pilots and then applied them to a more comprehensive plan. The problem we're trying to solve is multifaceted, but the biggest one is uh, right now, depending upon where you happen to live, your, your zip code greatly determines the access and the quality and the quantity of mental health services in Michigan. We think those barriers uh, should, be take, should be eliminated. Uh, mental health does not um, contain itself by county lines, and everybody knows that. There are some counties in Michigan, if you happen to be fortunate enough to live there, where they have terrific mental health services. Others not so much. And uh, what we're trying to do now is eliminate that artificial boundary, integrate it into a health plan, health plans, plural, that, that um, are designed to focus on outcomes and, uh, and then provide some accountability and transparency that is not present. We've had a series of committee meetings over the last few weeks. And in every one of those meetings, we've had interest groups across the spectrum and uh, in, in every one of those uh, committee meetings, we've also had to giving uh, testimony received indicating that uh, there's one thing that's missing. And this is from advocates and this is from people receiving benefits. This is from family members 
uh, trying to uh, navigate through the system for their loved ones, that there's virtually no consistent accountability and transparency in the delivery of our systems today. And so we're gonna take advantage of the asset, the asset that we have finally refined, has finally refined in Michigan, that's the, uh, our managed care uh, system, and then apply it to uh, and integrate mental health services in with the behavioral health, uh, physical health services. It is important to note that even back to the original 298 project, there was complete ex uh, expectation and agreement that the expected savings from improved performance and mental health uh, would accrue to physical health and those savings would be reinvested into mental health services. Nobody is suggesting for a moment that we're investing enough resources and we have enough providers uh, in our mental, mental health uh, system today. But what we are trying to do is, is uh, take, I'll, I'll just say, call it like it is, take middlemen and waste and administrative waste out of the system improve the fiscal health outcomes, save money there, and reinvest all of that into the mental health side of the equation. Um, I think the best part of these in interactions uh, results from the questions and answers. And so I'm gonna stop there and uh, partner up with Dustin and we'll go through some of the uh, questions maybe that were uh, previously supplied. And then we'll get into the, the Q and A through the chat process. So Dustin, I'm gonna stop there and uh, Let's, uh, let's uh, have a, some give and take. Hey, okay, thank you, Senator Shirky. Uh, I think the first question <clears throat> that I have is sort of this a way of exactly what you're calling for. Like, we, I understand that it's, it's sort of, you know, sort of eliminating the, the PIHPs. Um, and then, but where does, where does the responsibility shift in the, in sort of the, the, um, the accountability shift in your plan? It shifts to the health plans, just like we have it there today with uh, our physical health uh, providers. Um, you know, health plans have no fewer than four different state departments providing oversight over them. Uh, that is uniquely and dramatically different than the PIHPs that currently exist today. Uh, there's almost zero oversight over them. The county boards do their best. But even there, there's, there's conflict because there's members of the community mental health and PHP serving on each other's boards. And it's just, it's a bit of a conflict of interest. But the professional level, professional management that occurs and the attention to the outcomes for each individual patient is precisely what we're trying to achieve. And as I mentioned before, Dustin, if you happen to live in the right county, you've got great mental health services. But if you happen to not to, and we're going to, you know, if the plan is to, you know, health plans can sell in any county. And they can contract with providers in any county. And I think that'll uh, assist in raising up those areas uh, that are underperforming and also support those areas that are doing a ter terrific job. And, and what is the incentive for these health plans to exist? Uh, I mean, are there, are there people knocking on your door to, to offer these services in a health plan form? People knocking on their door for what? I mean, these health plans, like who, how is this health plan going to exist? Or, I mean, is it going to attract new providers? I mean, where, where are we going to go with, with, the, with a health plan that, that is different? Obviously, the oversight's different, but other than the PIHP, where are these new providers going to come from? So this, this integration, uh, although I believe it'll set up, create a system and a structure that'll be more inviting to providers, is not intended to increase specifically, is not intended to increase providers. That is a separate problem, a very serious problem. And we'll talk about that probably before we get done here with the, the, uh, the supplemental that we're prose prosecuting along with this reform package. So we'll get into that, I think, in a minute. And, uh, you know, the health plans that, we, that currently exist don't necessarily work great together. Um, so, I mean, where, how are we going to eliminate inconsistency in that system? Because uh, obviously you said, you know, Section 298 pilot had, had issues. Um, so, I mean... Where is the working together going to come from in, in sort of this, this new plan? I like the fact that families and patients and advocates can have choices now. Uh, be, right now, you have no choices. And that, to me, is, is more, far more important than, than uh, you know, having a, con a conversation about work, health plans working together. I want them to compete. And I want the strong to, uh, to uh, succeed magnificently. And I want the others to have to work hard to stay engaged. 
Sure, and this comes from a uh, live question here. And they, they, they mentioned that there's 10 I, PIHPs, and I think they are right on the 14 different health plans. Um, you know, but when they're operating, when a provider's operating in one area under one county, they're effectively are operating, um, you know, with, with one set of policies, one set of protocols. This now sort of makes them have to deal with multiple sort of prongs through one area instead of just dealing with one. I mean, it, it, the confusing part is, is whether th this is going to make it any better for large counties that have, I mean, because some of the larger counties do work well, and they're the ones that have the most, I guess, um, providers and the most, you know, things to deal with within a county. So how does this simplify that for, for how does this bring those two together? Well, at the very least, it will eliminate the middle management part of that and, and uh, the administrative load that goes along with that. And I think the health plans see they're in, they're in, uh, incented for outcomes, and we can't you can't succeed in even in physical health uh, outcomes in terms of a successful standpoint if you aren't also paying attention holistically to the patient, and that's right now is exactly what's not happening. You and I, I'm going to speak assumatively by about you, enjoy uh, health coverage that includes and is already integrated. You don't have to go through different channels to if you you or your family needed uh, mental health services. Same way with me. But these folks, they have a this Byzantine uh, system where they have to go one avenue for physical health and a completely different avenue for mental health, of which the two don't talk together. It's one of the major frustrations. We've had a number of primary care physicians that have given testimony in front of committee, very frustrated with the fact that it's difficult for them to get any information. Uh, on the mental health side of their patients. And they recognize and highlight the fact that they can't optimize outcomes for their patients unless they are able to access that. And that's what the integration administrative, financial and clinical can, can accomplish. Is this gonna sort of functionally be, and forgive me if I'm completely off base here, is this gonna functionally sort of operate sort of like a Medicare Advantage plan um, that we're seeing the health cares uh, that the health plans provide, or is this going to operate sort of on its own, you know, without a direct sales marketing campaign to it? Well, I'm of the age that I should know more about Medicare, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't yet. And so I'm not that familiar with the details of the Medicare Advantage plan. So I probably would not be capable of actually uh, opining on that right now. Okay. Fair enough. And then I want to talk medical loss ratios. I'm assuming you're familiar with those. Um, but if we look at sort of Michigan's Medicaid health plans, you know, they have a loss ratio of 79%, which means the other 21% goes to either administrative stuff or, or as I just mentioned, sort of marketing and, and trying to find people mm -hmm. where the PIHPs don't have to do a lot of that. So they are effectively at a 94% loss ratio, meaning that more money is going directly to care. So if we switch to, to these, these health plans, is less money going to be able to go directly to care? Um, do we have functionally any idea of, of how that's going to work? So, Dustin, I hope you're not offended by my, my answer to your question. Uh, I probably won't uh, be. Okay, good. Uh, this question continues to be brought up only by those who choose to ignore that they are apples and oranges comparisons. Sure. This question continues to come up by those who simply want to throw obstacles on the railroad tracks and create opposition and not really get engaged into an honest dialogue and an honest conversation. The fact of the matter is there are two different systems of measuring medical loss ratios. Uh, by definition, and once you add in all of the, or subtract out, depending on how you're looking at it, all of the things that Medicare uh, plans have to include, their administrative costs range or profit, profit costs are more in the three to 4% range. But nobody wants to get into that, roll their sleeves up and get into the details. They just wanna look at superficial data. So it's very frustrating. We've had this question come up in three different committee meetings. It's been answered mm -hmm. thoroughly. And quite frankly, if, uh, if there's, a, folk, if there's a, a group of folks who would like to have a debate about this one specific item, we should do it because it's, uh, it's I'm, as you can tell, I'm beginning to get a little frustrated with the, uh, the, uh, the inference, first of all, and the choice to uh, just cherry pick data. I, if, the, uh, if the PIHPs, were to be scrutinized the same way that health plans are across the board, both nationally and at state level, uh, I think they would they would find themselves in a in a deep the deep hole. Uh, so I just I'm just going to reject the question because okay. I, I've, we've explained it we've explained it three or four times and yet it still continues to come up and I can only imagine that it comes up from people who are either uninformed 
or purposely trying to just create opposition. Okay, and then um, another question coming from the live audience here is, is how will health plans be held accountable for focusing on the social determinants of health uh, with the same vigor in which they focus on the diagnosis and medication, uh, medicalization, sorry. Um, how, you know, because I think that's the biggest concern people have, right, is that the health plans are going to obviously uh, prioritize profit over, over you know, uh, individualized care. Um, you know, is there, is there an answer to that, I guess? Well, yeah, there's, an, there's a couple of answers, Dustin. First of all, a lot of services in the entirety of the full spectrum of healthcare delivery system today, both private and public, are done by for-profit organizations. Even in our current public health system, many of the services provided in that area are done by for-profits. I don't think profit is, I don't believe profit is a four-letter word. And, uh, and uh, the scrutiny that health plans have to live under to make sure that they're not making abusive profits does, is done by both the State Department and the federal government. The requirements there are very strict and very uh, narrow. And like I said, uh, Michigan uh, nationally is ranks very high in the financial performance of health plans. And quite frankly, if the outcomes are good or better, then why wouldn't we want to do that? Sure. And then I want to go back to, so, so Representative Whiteford's plan sort of mimics what, how they operate in Connecticut. Did you, for your plan, obviously I'm sure you had many stakeholders providing uh, advice and ideas. Was, is, there, is there another state that you're sort of saying, okay, there's outcomes like this in this state and that's how this state operates. Are you taking some of that and, and, and kind of developing your plan around that? Um, yes and no. Um, we've talked with and interviewed and, and researched and investigated most of the health plans that are actively involved in Michigan today and went through their experience because most of them are already involved in integrated health plan delivery systems in other states. And so we didn't reference necessarily specific states, but we referenced their experience in other states where they're already doing uh, integrated uh, delivery of uh, physical and mental health. And I want to point out here that that uh, another apples to oranges comparison is the integration of physical and mental health uh, through this uh, piece of legislation, Senate Bill 597 and 598, uh, uh, as opposed to, or in contrast to Senator uh, Representative Whiteford's uh, proposal, they're apples and oranges. And there's nothing wrong with what uh, many of the elements of what uh, Representative Whiteford is, is uh, proposing, in fact, some of it will be in, it will be included in uh, this plan, but they're not they're not integration. They really don't change the system. They just change how uh, things are are uh, certified. And uh, I I think that uh, there's room for a consideration for both. Uh, but the the proposal that the Senate has put in place is way more comprehensive, and it will actually change the system. And that's another place I want to go to with this questioning is is. When we're looking at how these are created and how these are structured, it, I mean, what is the, what sort of input are you getting from, I mean, obviously you said there, there, you know, that there were people, there are people in your committee meetings, um, lobbying organizations, nonprofits, companies, these are all on board. What are you hearing that is both in support of yours and in opposition? Because I think you, you I, I feel that you are a relatively honest person with like, hey, this is the opposition we're getting. Um, you know, there's room for improvement in all of these, I assume. Right. Um, this is a starting point as you've referenced. So, so what are you hearing from, from providers and what are you sort of provide, stakeholders? And then what do you sort of, what sort of changes do you think will be made along the way or additions or subtractions? So you are correct. We've had this full spectrum of people giving testimony in committee. Uh, by the way, before we even started the committee process, we had our team meeting with all of those same groups uh, for months, basically listening, getting their input and refining the uh, actual language of the, uh, of the two bills that we uh, submitted. The opposition comes primarily from those who don't want to change the current system. I'm just being fully transparent about that. They just simply don't want to change the current system. And I don't, I don't, hope, I don't begrudge them of that because uh, change is difficult. Change in a system that is complex as this is, is even more difficult. And we're dealing with people's lives who are very vulnerable. So I don't, I, I embrace those kinds of uh, questions, but to do it just to oppose for sake of not wanting a change, I think I call that into question. We have plenty of advocates and lots of patients 
who have said, you know, if you can do these kinds of things, which particularly around the areas of accountability and transparency, uh, we would embrace those uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, and then we have, we have uh, providers. I'm not talking about health plans. I'm talking about the actual providers who, who really look forward to long for the ability to take care of their patients in a whole, more holistic way and not have to deal with, uh, you know, deal with basically two different fragmented systems. Um, I believe most of the testimony we received so far has been in either full support or tentative support based on the kinds of changes that they've uh, suggested. And we are on our second, we're developing our second uh, substitute now that is all about uh, taking the input that we've received and including it for consideration into the final product, which I hope will be in a couple of weeks from now. Sure. And uh, so here's another one from the live audience talking about basically they work with 13 different CMHs. Um, each has its own procedures, policies, paperwork. Every, if you talk to anybody in this system, uh, paperwork is their number one enemy. Um, and, and so, you know, does this, I mean, obviously, I'm not sure you're that far along in this, but like, does this streamline that aspect of it? Does this have a way to 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 sort of streamline the 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 system? Because I, I do feel a lot of this, a lot of the stuff we talk about with waste could be eliminated with a with a more streamlined system that doesn't necessarily eliminate organizations or oversight, but just simply works in the same under the same set of guidelines. So, does this new system would this accomplish that in any way, or can it accomplish that in any way? I think it can, but I want to go back to the comments you made just now in in the sure. in formulation of that question. Is there is no provider that's delivering quality service is gonna be eliminated with this change. Sure. I mean, I mean, the, the no health plan has standby mental health services and providers at the ready idle, you know, yep. to bring in and displace people. And so uh, I believe uh, most of the uh, community providers at the community level will not only um, be embraced by the health plans, but elevated by the health plans. And then the question will often come is, how can we help you? How can we help you? How can we help you? And anybody that uh, is, is, uh, is afraid of what might happen with regards to uh, patient-centered care and health plans paying attention to the most granular level hasn't really studied what happens with the Medicaid health plans today. They have legions of phone bank people who are calling all of their patients on a daily basis, sometimes hourly basis, making sure that they're doing, following through on their appointments, commitments, et cetera. Now think about deploying that at full army on the mental health side as well, and then integrating that. Those are the kinds of resources that health plans can, can accumulate and provide, aggregate, I should say, and provide that is very difficult on the scale for the community health plan, uh, mental health plans to do. And uh, so I, I, I can't wait to get this implemented because though there'll be some bumps, I'm sure, I believe at the end of it, or even halfway through the beginning of it, uh, we're going to find that uh, those providers at the county level are going to say, "Oh my goodness, what a breath of fresh air! We actually got, we actually got communication, we got resources, we got services, we got we're being supported." Um, and those that are de delivering, I think, you know, the higher the higher quality system care today, and I'm going to brag a little bit about Lifeways in Jackson. It is a fantastic system, and uh, Mary Beth and that team that she's put together there, uh, I think. All, they'll, all they will experience is applause and the question of how can we help? How can we help? And so this notion that you know, providers are at the local level are gonna be displaced is, it really is ridiculous because we don't have enough providers uh, today. And so that would, now, if you're not delivering quality care, that's a different question. And that's where the accountability and transparency comes in. And then based on the, the, the sort of outcome based thing that we talk about, which I think, you know, when you're talking about uh, physical health, I think is a little easier with mental health. I mean, we're, we're talking about some people that have just severe intellectual developmental disabilities that don't have a way to get better. There is no there is no way to effectively make them better. So, you know, how how does a how does a provider not a provider? Sorry. How does this health plan work with with sort of taking on these people? but there's no outcome base here that's going to change their care. That's going to get their care better. Um, Cause I think that's, I mean, I think that's part of the reason we ended up with the system we're in. Um, you know, how, how do you keep that level to ensure that that care stays there? Is it just because providing care is, is a source of revenue through Medicaid, Medicare for them? So those, that cohort of folks that you're referring to, and uh, thank God 
you know, they're, they're they got, and God bless them for the, for the deal, what they have to deal with themselves and their families. You're right. They may not be able to get better, but they can get stable and they don't have to experience the highs and the lows and see, so the metrics will change Dustin for those kinds of folks. For people who can get better and can improve, those metrics will be very clear. Those who are unfortunately uh, experiencing things that you know, aren't curable, the metric there is stabilization, stabilization, stabilization. I point out to the, the uh, you know, how we've integrated the uh, children's special health mental health services in the uh, managed care system a couple of years ago. It's been a, a great success, small, small sample size, but a great success. And those are the kinds of things that, you know, I think we're gonna experience when we, when we apply this to the broader population. Okay, and then um, with that, you know, I obviously understand that Representative Whiteford's plan is different, but you know, we have this, uh, this idea that we need to do more for those with quote unquote mild mental, uh, I don't wanna say illness, but something like that. Um, Challenges, yeah. Right, and so, you know, that's a place where these systems have never been able to operate very great. It is, is really helping those with mild uh, symptoms, right? Um, is there enough? Is there enough incentive there to for for the health plans to then take on um, more of dealing with with mild symptoms under this thing, or is this or is this is a completely separate issue? It's not a separate issue, but it's uh, it's being purposely talked about with old data. Uh, there was a time when the health plans uh, were uh, were capped at the kinds of things they could service they could provide. That cap was lifted a few years back, and since then that data is dramatically different. But those who are again trying trying to create simple opposition will re, will refer back to the old data, and that's just simply not existed anymore. But I don't want to say it's perfect. I don't want to say it's perfect. There's no there's no there's no uh, level of perfection here. Uh, but uh, again, that's just another example of old data somebody bringing forward to you know create a little bit of opposition. Sure. So so this person and and uh, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this question correctly, but. Um, you know, how does this affect Medicare and Medicaid? You know, how do they operate any differently under this system? Hmm. Um, I don't, I can't answer the question with regards to Medicare. Sure. Uh, and so I don't know what the, the uh, nuances are between the two differences. And uh, I know I've got staff listening to this call sure. uh, and watching this call. And so Danielle and team, Let's make sure that we provide a written explanation, a written response to that spe this specific question. Thank you. And then uh, if you talk, you know, all of these plans are designed sort of to create efficiencies, which thus would then create um, uh, savings and then that savings can be re-entered into the system. I mean, this is a what, $3.4 billion um, uh, system here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but if you ask anyone that operates in this system, they're all, the, the number one complaint besides the paperwork is always, funding, you know, like we can't get enough money to provide the services we want, can't get enough money to provide the services we want. Is this a step in that direction or is this something that you believe fundamentally will create avenues to put more money into the system beyond just so, the, the sort of meager cost savings that may exist? I'm not saying they're necessarily, I shouldn't say meager, but, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, isn't going to just lead to windfalls of more cash coming in. Um, are there ways to, to, this system will be able to create more pathways for, for more funding? So in the beginning of our conversation, I talked about the uh, perfect storm of COVID and how it elevated and, and amplified and, and magnified the need for mental health services. And so, you know, to me, that was the trigger for us to get serious about this. But I didn't know, what I didn't know what was going to happen after to that was all of the federal money that was going to be made available uh, for states to use to address many of the things that are associated in the broad spectrum with COVID. So with why I bring this up, Dustin, is because I would, I, I'm excited about the integration proposal, but I'm more excited by the fact that we're going to do this and a very aggressive supplemental, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, invested into uh, mental health services, whether there's increased capacity, incentive for, for, for uh, getting, keep and provide, getting providers and keeping providers in Michigan, the, the full spectrum. And uh, the uh, governor is, uh, is finally, uh, thankfully, 
is uh, instructed, I believe, or the department to engage with us. I'm trying to prioritize where to put the, those kind of uh, investments. And so the two together, as a, as a result of what we've experienced over the last 18 months, I think provides us an opportunity to really um, make a difference going forward. And uh, it will address many of the uh, funding shortages, primarily the capacity shortages that we all uh, experience, especially in the pediatric area. Um. Another thing is, is, you know, if we look at sort of the, these, these smaller community wide systems, you know, they, they do develop relationships within communities, um, you know, connection to faith based community, um, j even in jails. Um, you know, can these new privatized plans still maintain that relationship or keep those relationships in place that have proven very critical, um, particularly in mental health space um, or severely disabled space? Um, not, only, not only can they, they must. Again, we go back to the question about nobody has resources setting aside, ready to come in and fill the voids for some, you know, those community-based programs are exceedingly important. And I think the, the uh, discipline that the health plans provide will actually enhance those things and nobody should be uh, fearful of that. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, another. And by the way, just, as long as we're on that question, yeah. Who's, res who's responsible? Will the department's responsible? The legislature's responsible? The behavioral health ombudsman is going to be responsible? There are, there's going to be a whole team of people responsible for making sure that the balls are not dropped. Correct. And then for another question coming through here, and I think, I think it's a question that seems to resonate a little bit as well, is when we're talking about in this space, it's, it's sort of uh, addiction treatment. Um, you know, statistics for addiction treatment isn't always very good. Um, so we talked about a privatized system that, you know, basically taking on um, someone that may not get better or their outcome is, is much worse. Um, you know, it, it, how do you create a, a positive return on that in this system? And, and I know that might be a little beyond sort of something you can answer, but um, is there a way to ensure that the health systems uh, affect our health systems, the health plans play in this space and really kind of prioritize, you know, sort of the stigmatized area of, of addiction and things like that, that we, we do struggle with in the state treaty? Substance abuse, just like mental health disorders, affect physical health problems, family problems, you name it. Mm -hmm. And so there is there is no reason and no way that the health plans are going to ignore that. Uh, however, I would change the, turn the question around and say, are we happy with the current status of substance abuse uh, plans in Michigan and the there's there's a lot of resources that are that are being applied but are we happy with the outcomes and uh, I would suggest that probably not and so uh, we can uh, we can we can um, speculate that health 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 plans will not participate and will not pay attention to this but I think that would be a mis a misunderstanding of the whole concept of an integrated approach to health because substance abuse is a, a key part of uh, helping people get through that so that they can live their highest productivity and pro prosperity. Sure. And, uh, you know, when we talk about this sort of integration between the physical and behavioral health, uh, I'm, I'm new to covering healthcare, so I'm still learning. Uh, so some of these questions might have been wonky, so I apologize. But um, we've seen a lot of investment um, from the health systems in behavioral centers. Uh, I mean, you can't, you know, every week a new one gets announced, announced it seems like. Is there going to be a way to, to really sort of connect the two? Or do you think that transition this plan is going to make physical health uh, systems, you know, the, the, big, the big hospital systems, focus or at least coordinate more heavily into in integrating mental health into their, um, you know, into their system? There's a few of the, our, our largest uh, healthcare delivery systems in Michigan that has placed a very high priority in mental health, mm -hmm. uh, not all of them at the same level. Uh, but I can tell you, I'm not going to name names of systems because I don't think that'd be fair, but I can tell you that I haven't run across the leadership of a health system in Michigan, not one, that is, that is anything but supportive of what we're proposing. Every single one I've talked to is supportive of what we're proposing. Now, they've made suggestions and, and tweaks and changes in, in some of the language, but every health system I've interacted with, and I've interacted with most of them, uh, are supportive of what we're proposing they know it's so important right and this is a, another question which uh coming from the live audience here um basically wondering and this is sort of back to the, the pilot program 
I mean, is there a number of counties that, that need the help in this space that we could do this before we wholesale change the whole thing? Is there a way to, to sort of pull off some of the counties that may be performing worse than others to do a pilot program, sort of as you suggested, um, to see the results, to see the, the living results of, of this proposal? Well, I'm, I'm smiling a little bit because we tried that uh, in many ways with the 298 pilots. And, and uh, I've, I've, been, I've, I've been very frustrated and very uh, upset with uh, the purposeful, uh, frankly, stonewalling of the, those pilots that were only intended to prove of concept uh, that's already occurring in other states just to provide a, la a soft landing on the transition. And they, were, they basically were stonewalled. And so again, with uh, what we've experienced and now with the opportunity to complement it with a very large uh, supplemental that will help us identify and address the constraints in the overall system from a financial standpoint, I think now is the right time to do that. So I, I, I'm not interested in doing a, a smaller pilot now. And, and then lastly, on that topic, if we really want to engage the full breadth of the value of the asset of the developed managed care system in Michigan, uh, we have to open it up to all of them and let them get in there and roll their sleeves up and create some competition. I give parents and advocates and families and patients choices as to what, how to access uh, mental health services that's consistent with and, and integrated with their physical health. And I can't wait to, uh, I can't wait to see the results, although it's gonna take, it'll be four years before we'll, you know, be able to, and here's another important point if uh, people haven't paid attention. We're putting, doing this in phases and we're counting on the system itself and those who are gonna be part of the, the oversight to define what are the success metrics of phase one before we can move to phase two and subsequent phases. And so, and if, uh, if we aren't meeting them, the department has a lot of control as to whether or not we give them more time, we change the metrics, we go backwards, which I hope will never happen. Uh, but it's been very purposeful and very careful because we're dealing with a, you know, an, a, a obviously a vulnerable population here that we want to be uh, very careful about. Right. And can you can you explain those those phases to me a little bit? I think I think everyone needs sort of a re up on the phases and sort of what the timeline is for those. The first phase is um, substance abuse and and uh, serious mental illness type stuff. The second phase in integrates in the next level. And then the last phase is the DD uh, population. And each one is intended to be about two years. Um, and uh, you know, I, hope we, I hope we can do it faster, uh, but um, we, we have to be very purposeful and careful about, about that because, because of the population that we're talking about. And how do you, how do you, how do you accomplish that with budgeting? Um, I mean, because then we'd be going through, we'd effectively have three systems operating instead of two. Um, and then each phase would, would sort of integrate it back into that third system. It will, it will make budgeting um, more complex in the short term. I'm going to stipulate to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, we, at the very, very beginning of our conversation, you know, nobody, nobody can claim that what we've got is working really well. Uh, everybody can claim that we don't have enough resources and providers. Uh, nobody would design the system like we have today. Change is disruptive and hard, uh, but you can't change if you don't start. You can't change if you don't start. And I think you've sort of contextually answered, answered this question, but you know, for the oversight in transparency, because this is, again, it, it, these health plans will be then thus paid for by the government. So is there an extra layer of transparency that needs to be added for this specific thing, or is it going to fall under an existing program or an existing sort of agency? Well, uh, like I said before, the health plans are, are regulated by no less than four state departments right now. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the Baby Behavioral Health Accountability Council that's being created as a result of this legislation, plus the Office of the Ombudsman uh, for Mental Health Services, that's something new. And then of course the legislature has to pay attention and, and hold uh, performance accountable. So there's multiple layers of oversight here uh, far more than what currently is applied to the current system. And so shame on us if we don't um, have our arms wrapped around us. And, and I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the ombudsman role 
I think it's very critical. And then the Behavioral Health Accountability Council that I think could really be a game changer here, especially in determining what the metrics are for moving from phase one to phase two and phase three and uh, determining whether or not they're being met at the, at the appropriate time. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the uh, aggregation of that group. And the, the council, uh, what is the makeup of the council? Who determines it? You know, I should have that right off the tip of my tongue. It's a, I think it's a 13 member or a little larger group that are appointed by various uh, representatives and agencies of, of government that all have certain specific uh, performance metrics associated with them. Again, I, uh, I should have that right in front of me, but I don't have it uh, verbatim. And so that's another response that I'll provide for this group so that they can see who can who makes up that council. And frankly, hopefully they'll there be people listening on this, they'll raise their hand, want to be on that council, because that's where we really want the uh, people to pay close attention. Sure. And um, sort of riffing off another question asked from the audience here, you know, um, are there lessons learned from, from 298? I mean, obviously it didn't go the way you wanted it to. Uh, and so you didn't get to learn a lot about implementation, but are there things that, that sort of existed within that that you think um, you wanted to address more directly in the legislation? That's a very excellent question. Are there lessons learned from the, I call it the failure of the attempts for two, on 298? I think the lesson learned is, is that the system is, first of all, everybody in the system today is sincere about their jobs. Nobody is in the system today than the current system who wants to do a bad job. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a Byzantine, to, to say the least, in terms of if you're a person who needs the services or a family member or advocate for those folks, it's really difficult to navigate, especially uh, when you're also uh, uh, faced with the fact that depending on where you live, you have different kinds of systems, different kinds of access, different kind of quality of, and different, different level of service. So, you know, if my, the lesson learned for me is on 298 is that it, we're just going to have to roll our sleeves up and do this. And the, my, my alternative or my acknowledgement that it's difficult, my acknowledgement that it needs to be done thoughtfully is to design it in phases that have very clear public acknowledgement of what the metrics for performance are before it can move on to the next phase. Sure, and uh, another uh, audience question here, um, more directly referencing Iowa and what has happened recently in Iowa, apparently, I, I am not familiar with that, so forgive me. Um, but basically saying that when, when these sort of structural changes happen, you see a lot of the, 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 the profit centers coming into the state, right? So, so the health plans are gonna jump on board, everyone's jumping on board on these new, this new way of operating um, because they believe there's, there's you know, I mean, I don't want to say cash grab, but there's, there's cash available and, and revenue available, um, which is what these companies are structured to do effectively. Um, but then they, they sort of navigate that system and realize that, well, it's not as simple as we thought. Um, you know, maybe maybe we took on too many people with long term issues and we can't fix this and the metrics aren't working out. And then you see a wholesale pullout of, of, of plans, um, as this person says, this is what recently happened in Iowa. Um, you know, is that a fear that that could happen here, I guess? Well, I'm not going to say it can happen, but I can tell you this. Most of the plans that are currently engaged in physical health uh, managed care plans in Michigan are already doing integrated uh, care, both behavioral and mental health in other states for which they're doing business. And so I'm not going to say that it cannot happen, but that it certainly shouldn't happen because we've, like I said, we've studied with them. We've talked to them. We've made sure that that uh, any of the constraints that they have experienced in other states uh, through the process of integration are addressed here at the, at the front end. And so I, I don't know much, I'm like you, I don't know much about the details of, of Iowa, uh, but we have tapped in seriously to the experience of the health plans in Michigan that are already doing this integration uh, in other states to try to um, mitigate that potential. And then um, another question from the audience here about, uh, is there ability to, is the system provided, have any oversight where public comment is important um, to where the public is going to be able to, other than obviously voting for people that, you know, their constituents um, are their representatives and senators, you know, is there ability to provide oversight into the system from a public standpoint? Sure. Through the department, through the Behavioral Health Council, through the ombudsman, through your legislature, 
there's a lot of opportunities there to provide provide input and you know even at the county level the the uh, community mental health boards at the county levels i think they can have they can now change their focus from being watching the financial side of it and really pay attention to the uh, outcomes and quality side of it and i think they can play a bigger role now than they ever have okay and i know that we've you've already discussed this is kind of a separate issue um but i think it's still an important one to discuss is how do we ensure more providers enter this space um, particularly if we're going to have a streamlined system particularly if we're going to try to handle more mild cases we're going to do better with you know if, if our mental health system is going to effectively get better we need to the only way to accomplish that is with more help um, and more providers um, and we're already dealing with a with a sort of fractionalized smaller version of a healthcare system than we were uh, a few years ago um, so how do we how do we build on that i mean is, i understand it's a separate issue but it is an issue that will be very real after this is implemented it's a separate issue, but it is very vital to the success for all of us and including the effort to integrate. I think we have to start, Dustin, with doing some exploration of what are the constraints that pro keeps providers from wanting to engage in work in Michigan. I don't believe it's only financial. I do believe financial is a part of it. In other words, the um, reimbursement is part of it. But I also think the structure, the complexities, uh, all those kinds of things that affect how you, you know, how you do your, how you do your daily uh, routines uh, from a provider standpoint, we need to basically do some research here and find out what are the true obstacles prohibiting the providers being trained in this arena from choosing to work in Michigan. Our university systems, our uh, higher ed systems that are putting out providers, they should be partners with us in this area. And Quite frankly, we should not be ashamed, uh, embarrassed or bashful about trying some incentive plans uh, that uh, that uh, could keep people around, you know, tuition forgiveness and things like, you know, student debt forgiveness and things like that. But I'm not going to suggest to you for a moment that we, this, that this proposal and integration is going to solve that problem. But that problem uh, is vital to the success, regardless of the kind of system that we have. And so I'm all in for investigating that. Sure. Sorry, I had a detour on my past life of covering economic development, and uh, I've got qu quite a lot of plans for that. Um, should, we, should we talk about Ford Motor Company moving to uh, Tennessee and <laughs> Kentucky now? We could if you'd like to, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm not sure the people on board here signed up for that. Yeah, um, yeah probably not. So with, with the health plans, this is another question from sort of the, an attendee is, you know, is this going to involve more than just sort of the two health plans that we can think of? I mean, it's in my mind, Southeast Michigan, I'm thinking of Blue Cross, Blue Shield and HAP. Are those two health plans at the table? Do we assume that, that all of the, the large health plans will be on board? I think uh, you can assume that all of them will be on board. Uh, we've heard from all of the health plans, not just those two. Uh, Blue Cross gave testimony in the last uh, committee and they were they basically batted cleanup. They are very, very in interested and supportive of this transition. They recognize that it's, you know, it's it's a uh, major change, but they also recognize the need for it. And so, um, but all the health plans have, just like the health systems, have uh, have have raised their hand and saying we we are support this. We want to be engaged, and uh, and they've been at the table the entire time. Um, okay. Then we have another question, which I think is is maybe an easy answer, but um, the role of federally qualified health centers, do, does that change at all? Do, do they play a role in this sort of new makeup? Um, I mean, I don't see a world where they don't, but uh, I'm just trying to figure out if there's if there's something different there. Um, there's, there's nothing different there. The FQHCs are a vital part now of our healthcare system in, in Michigan, particularly for the those who, you know, maybe earn too much money to qualify for Medicaid, uh, but don't have enough to have you know, uh, a commercial plan. I'm a huge supporter of our, of our H FQHCs, and I don't see that in any way going away. And frankly, like the providers at the mental health level, I think uh, there's a good chance that the health plans will actually embrace and, and actually uh, lift up FQHCs. Okay, and they're, really, questions... they're really important. They're really important. Yeah, agreed. Um, so there's, there's, this has come up a few different times, but, um, Will the, the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic uh, be incorporated in this system? Again, I don't know how that would disappear, but it, you know, is, it, is it going to be integrated into this plan or is it replaced in some way, shape or form? 
I hope it's fully integrated into the plan. And I, I strongly endorse the certification improvements and, in, and, uh, and, uh, and plans for uh, that arena. Uh, I think that training and certification levels holds people accountable and that it creates the expectations for performance and delivery. And so there's, there is no way that those are uh, mutually exclusive, no way. Is there, let's say this goes forward, I know you're, you're gonna be biased in this, but say this goes forward and it doesn't pan out the way we had hoped. Is there a way to reverse it? I assume there's not, but I mean, short of going back to the legislative table. Well, uh, I think that the phased in approach provides the tool to do so. And that is, as phase one is advancing, we're paying attention to the success matrix. It's, if it is performing fine, then go obviously transition to the next phase. If it's not, we really have to ask ourselves the question, why not? And that will then lead whomever is in leading it at that time to choose you know, what direction to take. Um, uh, nothing is irreversible. Uh, but I, I don't think, I don't think like we talked about at the very beginning of this our conversation, I don't think anybody would choose to reverse back to a system that we wouldn't design in the first place. Sure. And then uh, uh, walk me through the timing on this. Where do we, where do we think we are in this process? Um, I mean, I, these are, this is not something that can just happen overnight, even if it just sailed through Congress. So, uh, or the legislature, what, 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 um, you know, what, what are you, what is your timeline uh, understanding that it's likely going to be more hopeful than reality? Well, um, I am, I am hopeful for sure, but I am also uh, uh, optimistic that, that uh, we are now going to go to another level and the department is going to uh, be given the green light to engage with us. I'd like to see it uh, be amended and get out of the Senate chamber. Uh, within the next few weeks and then it let it nurture itself in, uh, in the house. Uh, I can't wait to engage with house members that are, have put, put mental health services at a high priority, just like uh, we have in the Senate and myself in particular. And uh, I think that the, the product, I think we can get a product out into the governor, you know, early, early uh, next year. Okay. Which you will not be around for, correct? I'll be around next year. Okay. Got one more year. Is that what it is? I'm trying one to more year. Trying to... That's right. Yeah. You're trying um, to get rid of me too soon, aren't you? No, 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 not at all. Just, yeah. just, I, I, I can imagine the feeling of, you know, this thing goes through and then, you know, it's your baby or whatever, and you don't get to see it in action. Uh, well, but... I do. Re I do have some, I have some regrets there that, that uh, it just, I was hoping a 298 would have take, taken root and got us to this point three years ago, uh, but it just didn't happen. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to be around to help nurture it, but I'm going to be watching very carefully. And, and um, you know, I have a lot of confidence that the legislature will provide the right leadership. And I also have a lot of confidence that the assets that we have in place in Michigan today, properly deployed and fully exploited, uh, can really enhance our ability to deliver comprehensive mental health services, result in reduction and better outcomes in physical health, which can then be reinvested in mental health. Sure. Uh, this one, I'm not sure you're going to have a, a direct answer to. Um, it says, are you open to considering a carve out of a self-determination uh, model of support under your proposal? Uh, I believe it's the federal language is self-directed services. Yeah, I'd have to get into the details of that. Uh, and you know, whomever is, thinks that's a good idea should contact my staff and put that into a, 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 a um, question in which we can reevaluate. We've got a lot of those kinds of questions that have turned into um, amendments to the current bills. And so this one may be one of those, but I, I wouldn't be prepared to uh, respond to that you know, off the cuff. Sure. Uh, and we're gonna wrap up real soon. So I, I do want you to kind of explain to people what, you know, how they should, because these are people that are in the industry, they're, they're seeing this on the ground floor, boots on the ground sort of thing. How can they get in touch with you and your people to, to have those questions, to have those conversations and to, to provide the input? Sure. Well, um, we've had three committee meetings, and so those are public, publicly announced, and we've had good turnout. And in each one, we've had uh, we've gone the full full two hours and ran out of time. And so uh, we'll have another committee meeting in a couple of weeks. And so that's one way. But it's not difficult to reach my office, and then my policy staff at my office knows how to advance and send any questions or any concerns or any recommendations to the policy staff. Is leading 
um, on this effort. So it's pretty easy, to, pretty straightforward to do that. Okay, uh, I think I'm out of questions. Um, and so unless anyone else has any last second questions they wanna flood the, the chat with here. Um, I, I do wanna uh, thank you for, for uh, being here and answering these questions and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be monitoring and looking for what's happening next. Absolutely, can't wait. I look forward to it, Dustin. Thank you very much.